Hello everyone, welcome back for this new session uh, with Thais for our design system journey. Hello Thais. Hey. So how are you? Good. Good. Finally we made it. Um, it's been a couple of weeks, like we want to have this as a regular weekly session, but yeah, you know how it goes. Sometimes you're just not really up for being on screen or something. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, it's cool to, to be here again. So. Okay. Yeah. Are we ready to so, to resume our journey? Yeah, let's um, okay. continue. Okay, yeah. let's go. There is a lot to talk about. So we have here our mind map of design systems. Yes. Or design system as a thing, as a universe, right? I think it would be worth having a recap of what we've built so far. Yeah, sure. So we basically were trying to get like a roadmap when you're involved in a design system or if you're building your design system, that what are the things that you're going to have to learn or that you're going to end up doing? There, There's many aspects of this universe, right? Yeah. So we started listing out, okay, when you're starting the journey, you need to learn the basics. And that means you probably need to read about atomic design system um, or just how to make your design system atomic by Brent Frost. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's how it. we pronounce his name. Yeah. So we put it even some nice um, screenshots of uh, what it is, the concepts of atomic design system. And we also mentioned design tokens is quite a, a hot topic at this moment and both for designers and developers. Uh, because this is also like we're trying to create a path for everybody involved, right? So you're in this much more from a developer's perspective. I'm in this from a designer's perspective. And so together we're trying to figure out, okay, what are the things that we both need to know? And definitely design tokens is one that touches both worlds in different ways. Um, then we have the, um, I would say design tokens, but more developer specific. That's what we came to a conclusion in one of our conversations, right? Yeah, that's it. Because you have a way to tokenize these um, elements of the front end whilst in our um, designers' softwares, it's not really something that we can tokenize yet as such. But certainly we would have to agree on like some kind of terminology and actually how to name these tokens that relate to these features. Uh, we also mentioned um, when we get into the aspects of style guide and pattern library, what are the differences? Between design system and a style guide or pattern lab library. Not major conclusions from this. I would say we just kind of put it there. And I also always like to remind, even though it's not our specialty, we're working mostly with uh, front-end technologies. It's important for us to know um, the mobile design system stuff, or at least be aware and try to align with mobile developers in the near future. Have you come across any challenges uh, design system wise with mobile, even though you're a front ender? Hmm. Um, not with native technologies because um, it's probably more specific to, it's, it's a specific area of development and um, we are more focused on the web interfaces. But using um, using advanced framework like uh, React Native uh, frameworks like Paper or something like that, we could, uh, we could address those specific devices with their specific guidelines. But um, um, I guess there is also um, Material UI from um, oh, I can't the name of the team behind it. But yeah, this is the same thing. Finally, um, being able to gather those the guidelines from the mobile's um, mobile related devices to, to uh, something more uh, more wider, get it to the web or other kind of interfaces. But being able to 
reuse everything uh, we got like. Yeah. I think with my experience on the mobile design system stuff, it was mostly indeed trying to align terminologies. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt quite out of place when trying to get on the same language level as the mobile developers because it just seems like their development environment is so different from front end that I was just completely lost. Um, but certainly a fun challenge. So feel free to add any like words or whatever you think can relate to this. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Do we have to put in it um, also frameworks dedicated, not targeting specifically um, native technologies, but also web technologies in this? Web technologies, but that relates to responsiveness or? Yeah. OK, wait web technologies that make up apps that you load on your phone mm. right that's yeah. what you mean yeah exactly uh yeah definitely like i mean we we haven't started with actually listing the technologies that you kind of yeah, use right. for design systems so that that's a good point because i think yeah basically we this is the area of learned basics but then we also started talking about like choosing the right tool and I think that kind of goes in the direction of technologies as well, right? Because eventually you're going to have to choose technology. So maybe it's a good idea to just list it. So technologies for design system in general. Um, kind of just want to make a bubble on this area. And I guess we can split into like what is just um, web technology or what is like modern technology for applications in general, if I'm saying those words right, I hope. Yeah. Like you're the expert here. You yeah. have to tell me <laughs> what do you understand about technologies and design systems? Yeah, I, I, um, this is, this is an area where, um, few technologies are starting to overlap together because, um, if we have a look at something like flutter. Flutter is a, is a framework dedicated to, to mobile devices. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's, um, it's a framework that could uh, produce native code for iOS and Android uh, platform. So not something like uh, React Native that is bridging web components and web technologies to the native ones, but Flutter really produced native, uh, native uh, mm -hmm. technologies. But the, the syntax of Flutter is totally narrated from React. So if you know how to develop a, a mobile-ish app with React, it will be totally um, comfortable with Flutter. But it's not, okay. it's totally not web technologies. It's uh, just the same, same patterns and same concerns, but, but, uh, but applied to a, a total different area of, uh, of technologies and of, of, of platforms. So um, it's not, it's not uh, that easy to split them between web and non-web because right. there is a lot of uh, bridges between them. But then as you're mentioning these things, you said React Native, Flutter. OK, so we don't make a split between web and mobile because they're starting to overlap. Don't know if I can represent that yeah. in any way, but I guess you could say like, they intersect, but they are like Flutter is a lot more mobile only, and React Native is the one that starts intersecting with it, mm -hmm. sort of, right? Yeah, yeah. We we also have things like um, uh, Native Script um, is also some kind of technology as um, React, but um, dedicated to other frameworks like Vue.js or Svelte. Okay. Um, which is nice. I cannot draw a circle with my hand. You'll hand like a Venn diagram, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Forget you know how it is. <laughs> um, okay. Also, I guess I need some kind of help in understanding the difference between frameworks and technologies. Yeah, um, the fact is frameworks are one kind of technology, 
So, um, mm. but uh, but all technologies aren't necessarily frameworks. A language is a technology. Uh, um, so, um, so when we say React Native, can you give me an example of a framework that is related to React Native? Uh, React Native is, um, huh, React Native is, um, we call it a framework. Oh, it's, yeah, okay, yes, it's a framework. <laughs> um, so, yeah, framework and problem is we have frameworks over other frameworks. I mean, React Native is using React in the back. Right. And React and, is and, technology. And React is another framework. And they Some are all framework. based on a technology named GSX, which inherits of JavaScript. So there is a large tree of inheritance. Ooh. Can we find technology. that somewhere on the web? Like web oh, is there something technologies? About it? Ah, yeah. Good question. Because maybe we could just um, hmm. put a ready image. Uh, tree. Okay, I'll, I'll search for tree. I found an interesting one. Don't know how relevant this is. I mean, I think I have to save it first. Let's see. As a designer, when you start a new to work on a new oh my what, what was this? <laughs> Just found it on the web. Oh wow. It's titled Family Tree of Web Technology. Yeah. And I guess the colors relate to it doesn't explain. Oh my god. It reminds me a lot of all technologies like <laughs> yeah, HTML. Right? What is DHTML, Jamie? DHTML okay. is dynamic HTML. So dynamic HTML is some HTML where you could replace some blocks in it. So it's finally definitely what we we did um, after that with Ajax. Oh wow! Oh la 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 la. So That's Ajax awesome. is not even mentioned here, is it? <laughs> yeah, it's nice. It's a good um, it's a good history of, of it because um, yeah, we could see some some kind of evolution. We we see we could see um, action script in it, and action script um, was a language in Flash based on JavaScript. Um, yeah, and we we could see it is inspired by ECMAScript, so it's JavaScript basically. And um, and finally, the, the the modern version of JavaScript, uh, ECMAScript five, and so and so on. Are definitely um, inspired by ActionScript, but were first cool. inspired by JavaScript. So it's it's a kind of loop. Um, yeah, for history perspective, it's it's. Um, yeah, and I think they start over here at the bottom. So... Yeah, there is two starts. There is a a start at the bottom if you want to start with the web yeah. platform, and a start at the top if you want to start with a uh, um, low level languages like. C, C++, right. basic, and so on. Yeah, I only recognize a couple of these things. Like, I get that, for example, here on the right, it's more to do with the um, database. Yeah. Because of SQL stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, Java, I wouldn't really understand how Java works on the web at this point. But then PHP, I recognize because, you know, WordPress is built on PHP. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, there's... Python, Ruby on Rails, it's also another, these all these different things that I've, I've seen these words before, it just never worked with it. Like really <laughs> from a design perspective, like I'm more on this area where it starts off from, you know, Photoshop, Illustrator, mm. Flash, very late. I didn't really touch Flash back in the day, but then went into HTML, CSS, and then CSS2, CSS3. Mm, yeah. Um, but yeah, so this, I guess, it's a better term for technology. Yeah. And then when we start saying like React Native, Native Script, those are more frameworks, aren't they? That's yeah, a good definition. Frameworks, I'm just going to put it here technologies. 
and but you were you were gonna ask me something uh, to, yeah to do with yeah um, definitely design. um when 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 you start a new design system as a designer um do you do you have in mind the kind of um platform that you want to address with it or do you do you design it in a total agnostic way of the final devices or um Maybe not devices, but final platform or something like that. I think uh, it's a very good question. It, of course, depends on the product that you're working on. Because I don't think any designer just starts a design system for the sake of it. Um, mm. It's not like we want to have libraries just sitting around in our Figma or Sketch um, software. So I would say that uh, if you are hired to a company that is only working on developing a website then yeah you're not really going to care much for like some components that should be platform specific like uh, um, menu navigation of an iphone at the bottom kind of elements you know so uh, you most likely will start your design system for web so you're gonna go on the web and find uh, a good design system that either you used before or that you heard about like material mm. and just start building your components based on that. So, but if you're hired for a company that is developing an app and it's a native app, then you most certainly will look into getting some ready um, components that you can find in the community. So for example, one thing that we do, you can go inside community and search for like um, iOS components. Um, so it's nothing that you will have to define new. You just download the best latest kit that you can find. Mm. Let me see which one we have here. For example, I think um, normally a good uh, way to see if it's a good file is to see how many people duplicate it. Mm -hmm. um, you also try to search the one that is relevant for what you're designing. So maybe the company that you're working in is not like designing for iOS 15 yet, they are still on iOS 13 or whatever. So it doesn't really make sense to get some of these keyboards that are like up to date whilst the entire company isn't yet. But at least the advantage, uh, especially with the these uh, newer softwares that we have, this community space, when so one person created these components and now I, I can just duplicate and, and have it for my own. So you can see the design system um, from a like speed perspective that I just want to be able to like design as many iOS screens as quickly as possible. I'm not going to waste my time re reinventing the wheel. I'm just going to get these ones that are here. However, once you duplicate it and you start to see how these components were built, if you're a design system geek like me that likes to build the best components in Figma for my own use, I'm gonna have to double check if their choice of like layering and naming and terminology and, and everything is something that I agree with, or if the options to like, when you insert this asset in a design, let me get to a like, test page. And I try to include uh, these components. Let's say I'll go for the keyboard as an example. I need to see then what are my options here as a component. I can um, define the type. So in my design, I need the emoji keyboard. Do I like that he chose these as frequently used? Mm -hmm. Maybe for my own design, I would prefer something else. So I would go and change it myself. Um, but I guess another more practical example is something like this a button with a label. And in the process of designing it, I want to be able to change this icon very easily. So I'll have to investigate how this was made. So like it only gave me the option between primary and secondary. And I also see that there is a misspelling here on primary. Um, it gives me the option between light and dark mode and sizes. So now how do I change this icon? I go in here and this shows me it's a, an, a component within a component, right? So it's an, an atom. So I can define the type of icon here. So that doesn't make sense to me to try to change. 
but I could replace it with an image, for example. So these kind of little building blocks to each asset that you generate for your designs, either you get used to what somebody else built and you're happy with that, or you just dig deeper to make changes to these components to make it better for yourself. Mm -hmm. But I'm not answering you the question on um, which one do you start defining uh, as a design system. So I guess it, it really depends. Um, I would say it, it's like kind of a chicken and egg question. Um, which one comes first, the design system or the product <laughs> that you're yeah. designing? All right. You need components to design a product, but you need a product to think of components. Mm. So like, I'm finding it an interesting challenge with our own interface on Backlight. Actually, I can show you that because um, I've been making our um, own uh, Backlight Rev design system. I think it's inside my design system thing, Rev, yes. So you're familiar with our backlight interface. And what I had to do is break down the components in that interface. And I started with the easy ones, right? So I started defining the button already with uh, some kind of visual language for the library itself as well, because I want to keep it clean from the start. And so I'm organizing each component nicely and um, just trying to get the best way that I've built that all the times that I built a button, like this is, um, in my opinion, the best way I can do it. If I need to make a button or if I need to add an icon to the button, it's an option here that is always hidden, for example. So yeah, I started building a button and then soon enough I realized, oh, we have this kind of button group. So I need <laughs> to build a button group. And then soon enough, it's like, oh, we also have buttons with a sort of a drop down that have a title and a subtitle. And then every time that I take a um, screenshot from our um, backlight, I try to see even more like how many components do we have. So I built so far buttons, pills, and the ones that make up the, the bar, um, form controls, like. Um, check boxes or radio buttons, forms in general, like inputs with um, select and passwords, for example. And there's a couple more here. What is this? The tabs, they're quite relevant. And we have two types of tabs. So like, I still classify them as tabs with just two different styles. And mind you that all these buildings or uh, components that I'm building in Figma, I, I'm not talking to, to you guys, the devs yet, of like, how do you name this? Do you call this a tab or not? Mm -hmm. Because I feel that we uh, are setting up the design system for the backlight interface as we go as well. But at some point, I'm going to have to make sure that I come back here and whatever I define that this is like an active tab or that we all agree that this is a tab and not anything else. Um, like. I don't know what other word would use for tab, <laughs> um, label, yeah, or something. Yeah. Um, avatars, search box. I think I yeah, no, I didn't finish it yet. So I built those items, or mm -hmm. more, I guess you could call them a molecule. Yeah, maybe molecules. Yeah. And now I'm starting to build the organism. So I have the entire navigation top bar as one piece. Because I know that every time I want to start a design, it's always the same. I need a navigation, the sidebar, boom, boom, boom. And once I build all these different elements, like a sidebar with all the list items and icons and the scroll bar, in a sense of design system, it's not a design system thing as such, because you're going to build the interface and you're just going to say, you know, this space is the sidebar. Hmm. But for Figma, it makes sense to me because I always reuse it. So I made myself a component for that. So when I want to, for example, start building quickly, I go inside my templates um, here, and I put my navigation 
then I put my sidebar and then I put my other sidebar, sorry, the menu, I called it. Uh, where was it? Test here, assets menu. And then I put the code side. And then I put the review side and boom, I have the backlight interface. Mm -hmm. So I would start building components that make sense to the designs that I need. And every time that I'm going to design something new, I have to think of like, oh, this should probably be a component. Mm -hmm. So for example, right now I need to say, uh, or make a design for when you click on this ellipsis and you get the drop down. And I haven't made the drop down yet. So if I don't go and go back to my components and actually think of a drop down from the beginning and, and define it, what I'll have to do each time is draw a rectangle and then define like radius, define the, the color for its like VG. I think that's how our drop down sort of looks like. And then put text, right? But then, as you can see, it's a lot of work. Like, I, I better just try to get something of a component for me to be quicker in my future designs when I need to show a design of a drop down. Mm. It's and it, it totally makes sense. But is it is it something that, um, that easily um, be shared with, with the, the development teams? Or, um, because um, you may see some components at some point when you're working on the design because it's easier to, to do and undo and redo things. Um, but they won't be a component in, in the time of code uh, in, mm. in the final, um, final implementation. So, um, is there some some limitations, some caveats to to um, when you want to share the design and the different components? Yeah, definitely. Like if you think of a, or if I define myself a component that never becomes a coded component, how am I going to keep track? Especially if I'm part of a big design team, how am I mm. going to keep track that? That's actually the case that we we talk to the developers it doesn't make sense to make into a coded component but it makes sense for me to speed up my design process mm. so how do you keep things um organized in that sense and i guess then you you can start thinking uh from a governance perspective and at that point you probably have a design system team to kind of organize all these thoughts for the rest of the designers. And I would suggest, for example, to have a separate file that is like easy for design and a file that is like the design system that matches the code, mm -hmm. for example. Or if you don't want to do it in separate files, at least you organize it in different pages or you, you name it in a way that it's then very easy to understand for when the designers inspecting, sorry, the developer inspecting these elements will know, oh, okay, this is navigation. Navigation is not a um, component. It's just an item of the interface. Yeah, okay. Right, so I could just like, instead of naming it navigation, I could say like only design dash navigation, only yeah. design. Something like labeling things that so, so we, we easily know if it's a design specific things or something that could be shared with the code. Yeah. Okay. So, and mind you that the whole time that I explained to you these components that I've been creating, I haven't thought about how they look in mobile, even for responsive. So mm -hmm. not even if I'm saying like, this is a technology specific or even responsiveness. Um, I mean, Figma does have some interesting features that if you resize things in your design, so if I provide you a design for web and a, a design for responsive, when I squeeze the elements, it will properly like uh, yeah. fit everything together. Rearrange and okay. rearrange, mm -hmm. but um, sometimes it's uh, I have to like make different versions for the the responsive component and uh, the desktop component, and. I don't think there is any way for me to reflect in Figma that this is like a React component or an Angular component as such. Mm. 
I think then that's kind of more like under the hood framework that I like, I guess for designers, the component is just what it looks like and some of its functionality, but I think you guys from development, you think a little bit more the differences that each technology will either like uh, block you or allow you to do that component, right? Like a React button is the same as an Angular button? Yeah, um, probably not. It, I guess it, it depends your um, your final use of the technologies because um, if we are just talking of generating some, um, let's say some static stuff like, like we do with the, the uh, landing page of Backlight, or, or the DevRiot website, they are all generated using a tool named Astro. And mm -hmm. Astro is using um, is using the reactive frameworks like React or Svelte or Angular or Vue, blah, blah, blah. And um, mix them all and merge them in a static web page at the end. So it does the complete, is a complete um, duration process uh, during the build time. And we don't use uh, the React or or, or view framework in the client side uh, after that. But when you are um, working on a web app or, a, or an application based on web technologies, um, mm. then you will probably want to stick on one technology only just not to overload your uh, your final client app. So, um, so you will pick React or Angular or you build your, uh, your final client and stick to it. So um, so after that, it does some limitation um, due to the technology that you want to use, <clears throat> probably. But I I I don't really see them um, when it's just a question of implementing the design and creating the design system in it because um, finally it's, it's just um, putting some pixels in place and moving them on the screen, like say Kidzy. So yeah, it's it's just whatever the framework you want to use to build a component or to uh, style them. Finally, um, you are just taking the different um, variations of styles from the the design part of the design system and put them on the final components in your code. So um, so finally, the, the Rosetta Stone of the design system are the, the tokens. We are just yeah. uh, trying to store all the variables inside them, so it will be easier to just take them and apply them on different parts. No, I agree. Yeah, exactly. So I wonder, um, yeah, because to me, there's a lot of uh, attention given to like the names that we're going to define these mm. components but in the end like the bulk of the attention should be definitely on defining the tokens because that's the only piece of information that gets carried over to the rest of the um, regardless of the technology or yeah. framework or whatever and for now as you can see the tokens that i have defined is really just to do with colors and typography so I started defining some more specific to do with like the application of that color in text. So I'm calling this one um, based on our, uh, what we have inside backlight that this is dash dash color text. And for example, dash dash color BG dash VS dark, because I was inspecting it and that's how it's called in code. So I wonder like, because we start to get like all these different variations of gray. And what's the logic of our usage of this? You know, sometimes we use one background, another background, mm. and yeah, coming up with the right funneling of the usage of the colors, it's it's quite difficult. And sometimes you just need another contrast in you, know, or just a slight difference between this area of the interface and that area, and then we come up with another gray for that, and it's it starts getting a bit messy. Mm. So yeah, that was uh, on the, the components for mobile. Um, then I, I guess if I had to design the entire interface for a mobile app, I would try to carry over some of these components that I built for the web, like buttons. I wouldn't 
build a separate one for iOS because I'm sure in iOS we could make our buttons look like this. Yeah. So I think then it's more like towards the unified design system. But sometimes for easiness of which libraries your file is using, like this is something that you define here, like, oh, I'm going to use this library, that library, that library. You might, if you're doing an iOS design, you might want to just have iOS related libraries. So you would eventually see a duplicate of a button that is on web, the same as a button for iOS, just because then we decided to like have two separate libraries because mm. iOS has all these keyboards and other yeah, elements that I'm never going to use on web. Okay. Yeah. Because then it, there is also like a loading um, time to, to the files. If you build like a super complex, extensive one design system to roll them all, um, yeah, you, you probably will end up with very heavy files. And that might not be the, the easiest. And as you're mentioning then about yeah the different um, frameworks not really mattering and it's a decision that you just go like later down the line. Do you think it would be useful for designers to be aware of which framework the design system is on? Hmm. That's a good question. I guess um, I guess this is the same thing when you are um, designing for print and you have just to know how the print process is working. It doesn't mean that you will print by yourself your final designs, but you have to understand what is the color space, how does it work, how the printers are, are working, which which kind of inks um, is it? Uh, uh, I can't recall the name. Um, three three chromatic colors or monochromatic mm -hmm. colors or two chromatic colors or something like that. So just just because um, it will, at some point, it will probably constrain the way you are working on your design or, or at least to produce the, the final pieces of your design, the ones that you are sending to the printers. And um, I guess it's probably the same thing um, in our work when we work on designing a design system and implementing design system. You you probably don't have to know exactly how the technology is, is working on the back. But um, you, it, it would be probably easier for every part, um, designers and developers, if you know which constraints are, are brought by the framework uh, or the other the technologies that, that are used uh, in the end. Because sometimes we, we, we don't choose the technologies we are constrained by or the, 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 the situation, or the, yeah. some, some client situation, or something like that. So, um, so, yeah, no, I think that's a good way to put it, and it, it's a great parallel that you're making there. Um, because indeed, I feel that I mean, I did some design for printing, so I remember, you know, having to mm. understand about the the bleed area and this and that. Yeah, understand the. C-M-I-Y-K? Yeah, C-M-Y-K, yeah, C-M-Y-K. Yeah, <laughs> because I just, I, I remember this in Portuguese because that's the way I was in Brazil at the time. So like we say semiki. <laughs> that's why I was like having uh, difficulties with it in English. But anyways, um, yeah, like understanding like that you, you need to provide a file in, in C-M-I-Y-K instead of R-G-B because otherwise it's going to come out completely different than what you initially thought simply because the, the print technology is different in terms of colors. Mm. Um, yeah, the bleed area, the, the this, the that, the that. And there was a lot of focus on understanding how a printer worked. And now I think with technology, because it's everything is so digital and mm. seemingly easy, there is maybe some more disregard on how, or like even the interesting learning, the, the limitations of that specific framework or technology. Yeah. But at the same time, there are a lot of designers that are like big nerds like me out there that do like to know what <laughs> the limitations are. Yeah, and I, I guess um, sometimes it's just just to be aware enough the the rest of your team and just be able to understand when a developer is just coming and say, I just I can't just do that because there was a lot of limitation that this is not something, this, 
it's not that I don't want to do it, just I can't with our actual tech stack. Sorry. So, um, so yeah, sometimes we have to find some shortcut or some workaround to do things. Yeah. Um, and so just to continue then on yeah. the frameworks and stuff, React Native, Native Script, is Angular, uh, Angular is one, right? Yeah, um, we can find. So um, what are we trying to do? Just to, to, to list um, some kind of web frameworks that we could use? Yeah, I would say so. We have Angular, we have um, Vue.js, we have Svelte. Um, we have React and and Preact. Um, oh, I don't think I ever saw Preact. Actually. <laughs> uh, be creative, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what do we have also? Uh, regular ones. Um, we have Solid, which is a, a new candidate. Oh, which is really nice. Um, heavily inspired by React, but uh, more efficient. Probably. Um, and do you think with new frameworks also come new styles or like new design elements that hmm, that's we didn't see in their, in other frameworks? That's interesting because um, all of them are um, an advanced version of um, HTML. It's just a way to improve the 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 way you are writing your markup. And dealing with your market. Um, and it helps to add a lot of logic on it to, to power the actions and the reactions of the content and so on. But it's not necessarily dedicated to the design part. And the styling part is is um, more or less still based on, on uh, CSS. Okay. So, um, and maybe... it would make sense then to separate things, exactly. right? When, it come, when we talk about styles, yeah. style framework. Yeah, so styling that, framework is probably something uh, something nice here. And like this. in this styling. one, we will have things like um, the regular one, so SAS and SCSS. Mm. We will have Stylus, which is my favorite. I know it's an unpopular opinion, but I do like Stylus. <laughs> um, what do we have also? Less, of course. Um, and we have advanced framework based on them, like Tailwind. Tailwind. Um, so, uh, and uh, multiple variations of Tailwind. Um, what do we have in kind of CSS frameworks? CSS. Let's see if I can find an image on the web for that. Um, and an interesting thing is that um, apart from um, those specific styling framework, we have mm. some kind of um, meta framework or transversal framework like um, open props, which we saw uh, coming um, Last, last week, something like that, which is a... You're, you're completely losing me there. So yeah. Like... <laughs> <laughs> so Open Props, it's um, it's a new project that I discovered, um, yeah, probably last week, something like that. And it's a collection of CSS custom properties. And that's okay. all. So it brings you a lot of different variables, so a lot of custom properties for colors, gradients, spacing, typography, and and so on. So you could definitely base your um, your uh, final styling on those custom properties, but it doesn't bring a, a lot of CSS um, classes, utility classes to set uh, the gradient, to set the spaces, to set everything. This is just a container for, uh, for the variable. So a container for kind of definition of design tokens. So um, so it's interesting because I can't put it in the styling framework because it doesn't style anything, but you can okay. definitely use it as a foundation for your, your styling process. Hmm. 
Very interesting. So yeah. So it's like we are adding more abstraction layers to kind of simplify how of course <laughs> the HTML <laughs> reads things, yeah. basically, right? That that's yeah. in the end, that's the goal we're trying to do here. Because that, that's how CSS came about, right? Like you could style a page with inline styling back in the nineties, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um but then CSS came as an idea of like, okay, how can we make this easier? And so they made the style sheet. And now we are creating other layers of complexity. Exactly. Because to simplify even more. Yeah, because we, we are just trying to um, improve the developer experience in the end. Right. It's just giving advanced tools to simplify the process and that uh, very cool speed up different bottlenecks. So it's it's interesting, but on the other way, um, there is also there is still a lot of developers that are, that are still working with jQuery uh, just to pour some kind of dynamic action on your markup mm -hmm. that never used uh, uh, React or Vue or Tailwind or is it, and they are I mean, not aware of those technologies. So, um... Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just there are different ways. There are like a hundred different ways to build a website, basically, right? That's what we're saying, yeah, and build exactly. apps. And one is going to be more efficient than the other, basically. Mm -hmm. And and because we are um, we are constrained by by the um, the platform by itself. I mean, um, the web platform is here for almost thirty years, and it's uh, we have this backward compatibility over thirty years. The websites that you did uh, in the late '90s are still working uh, right now, but we now have an advanced way to do the layouts in CSS with Grid CSS mm. or Flexbox or whatever you want. But what was working uh, 20 years ago do have to still work right now. So we have these backward compatibilities that we we do have to to maintain, and it brings a lot of complexity because we still use the same technologies in the back HTML, JavaScript, CSS. You could do it with just that, but do it, doing it by hand is just a nightmare. Mm -hmm. So we built some tools and some tools and some tools and some tools, and we just mm -hmm. have a big stack of things just to improve the, the, the way we are just making websites. But <laughs> then we are just pouring some websites in the web. So, <laughs> so, so. yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely much more fun to navigate around the web these days than yeah. what it used to be back in the day, right? Definitely. There's so much that you can do. Like, well, Apple's website is a great example of like, it's so immersive to just yeah. like navigate through, like trying to understand their products. Um, and we make it like all these animations and it's all adaptive. Mm. And it's it's all because of these technologies, I would say. Yeah. And where would you fit like something like Bootstrap in this oh. styling framework conversation? Um, I would say probably same way we, we use SAS or Stylus or Tailwind or we, we will have Bootstrap here, I guess. Okay. Or cool. if 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 we want to be more more precise, I I guess we we will have to split it again between um, languages. No, I don't know because <laughs> yeah, because um, less is kind of like a way to yeah, it's just to it just uh, to write CSS, another CSS it? flavor, but uh, it's still yeah. CSS. So, um, but Tailwind and Bootstrap are kind of pair in in terms of yeah, their, more kind are. of I don't know libraries collections mm. of things. Yeah, because Bootstrap didn't really create anything except for just defined some pre some ready sets of variables and classes that you can reuse. And so that would cut time from you having to define all those basic things yourself, right? Mm. But I, I feel that on the front end world, like people dismiss Bootstrap almost completely these days, isn't it? Like it's not famous anymore. Yeah, yeah, no, it's. Not. <laughs> I guess it's not. <laughs> I it's just, hope it's not. For me, it was so easy to understand, and now things yeah, are so yeah, complex. Yeah, and I'm like, and oh god. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that there is there is some use cases that where Bootstrap is is really good. If you want to build 
if you want to build Twitter, it's really good. <laughs> if you want to build, <laughs> if you want to build um, to build a, um, an administration panel or something where you could easily put blocks and interact with forums, um, it's a really good candidate because it comes not only with um, an advanced styling process, but also with a collection of components that you could easily just plug in and and have them working on your uh, your interface. So. Um, for those use cases, it's um, yeah, it's it's pretty nice. Okay. But to design a website or to design a, a um, an application like Backlight, it's just totally totally bloated and and not dedicated to those use case particularly. I see. So, um, cool. Well, I like how today we went a bit more on the dev side uh, because I feel that. Maybe because of the name design systems, it always tends to go in the direction of design. But um, it's really interesting to see what's out there in terms of framework. And I guess for the future, what we could do once we like organize this mind map in a more cohesive way, by the time that we finish like discussing all these topics, it would be nice to like edit uh, or add the links to all these things mm. so that when somebody is actually navigating through it, they can. Uh, just go and read more about that. Yeah, it it it's led me to seeing that um, maybe we could think this um, this big mind map as as something like um, we we probably can't just have two entry points. Uh, you are a designer or you are a developer, and here are the funnel to to get access to to the different components because um, because. At least from the developer side, but I guess it's probably the same thing on the designer side. Um, it won't be the same thing if you come on the developer side and you already know React or you never heard about React or you want to build a web application or you just want to build a website. Or um, there, there's there a lot of differences. Yeah. I mean, in terms of um, culture and in terms of um, destination of your design system. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Because, yeah, we, we can try to talk about design system as a universal thing, but it really gets specific to the end result of your product. Yeah, I guess there is um, there is some common patterns shared by all design systems, but we probably have to make things specific depending on the context. Yeah. No, definitely. So I guess it will be useful for us to identify these universal design system patterns and sort of classify it that way. Yes. And then start digging into the, the specific towards the type of application that you're going to, to work on. And I guess I could also make a parallel to that on like the type of application for the user that you're working on, right? So if you're working on um, users with disabilities, for example, that there needs to be a heavy focus on accessibility. It's going to be another entry point to actually defining all these things that you need to define in the design system because, well, you should have them as your focus before you even define anything else. So yeah, no, I like where this is going. I think uh, we're getting to some interesting concepts. And I wonder if eventually I could like write some specific articles to each of these areas that we're like starting to map. Yeah. And and I like also how like every time that we get together, we just come to like new concepts or well, not new, but just we touch upon areas that yeah. design system <laughs> works in, right? But, yeah. That we haven't thought in, in one go. Yeah. It, it's freaking me a bit because I'm just I'm just thinking, okay, we we won't we won't finish this mind map. Never, ever. <laughs> so, we'll or maybe a new topic to address map. where we will say, okay, and this kind of specific things, what we could do with this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think we'll we'll get somewhere. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely fun to, to give it a try at least. And I, I mean, for the future of these uh, talks that we have every week, it's really just um, exposing like how uh, our work uh, with uh, DevRes and and how the, yeah, a developer and a designer can work together. And here's an example, right? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really good idea. I like it. Cool. So I think um, 
let's call it up for today. Yep. Lots uh, that we talked about. Very interesting. And I definitely have some new words to Google and do some reading. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Thank yeah. you. See you. I'll see you next time. Yeah. See you next. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.